All right, come on. Matthew 11 is where we are. If y'all there, just say, I'm there, Pastor B. Oh, that was weak. Say, I'm there, Pastor B. All right, Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to just jump right in. Verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John heard, that's John the Baptist, by the way, heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and he said to them, are you, he said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered him, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have the good news preached to them or proclaimed to them and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowd concerning John. Just pay attention to what he did. He's talking to the disciples and he's telling them if he's the one or not. And then he sends them away and he turns to the crowd and he begins to talk to the crowd about John. So he says here, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. And then did you not, uh, what did you not go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. That's important. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is he whom it is written. Jesus is about to quote Malachi 3.1. Behold, I am sending a messenger before your face who will prepare the way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of a woman, there has has arisen no greater, no one greater than John the Baptist. Let me read that again for repetition and clarity's sake. Verse 11, truly I say to you, among those born of a woman, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. I want to preach today from the topic entitled goaded. Goaded. I don't know if y'all know what goat means, but it means greatest of all time. I want to preach from this topic. Let's look to the Lord before we dig in. Father, uh, we are grateful for the opportunity to lay before your word. We, t- we don't take this moment lightly. And so, Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to move in this room. Father, would you empower me to preach your word? Give me clarity of thought and clarity of speech and boldness of heart to proclaim even tough things. And Lord, I pray that we would also receive and hear and be enamored by your son, Jesus Christ. So at the end of the day, Lord, that's, that's, that's the goal. That's the agenda, is Jesus. So move on our hearts today through your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Goaded. Hey, I think you guys should know at the start of this sermon that I actually worked really hard to resist the urge to do any goat comparisons between LeBron and Jordan. I, re- I really worked hard. I feel like, you know, the last few times I was in here, I, was, I wasn't received well. I, I, feel, I feel like the last couple times I talked about Jordan and, goat, uh, Jordan and, 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 uh, and LeBron being the goat, I, I just feel like many of you are just blind and disobedient <laughs> and believe that Michael Jeffrey Jordan is the goat and, he, and he's not, and he's not. It's okay, You're, like, y'all can push it. Look, I'm not scared of y'all. I just, like... Y'all are blind and the spirit has not revealed what, the, what he's saying to the church to you guys. But I, 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 you know, I resist the urge today, so I'm actually going to focus on another sports figure that we might be able to come to some kind of consensus on, and that's Muhammad Ali. I think we can all agree that Muhammad Ali is one of the greatest boxers of all time. And if you're in this room, and you're going, no, 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 Mike Tyson, like, no, nah, I got other people, you know, you got other people that you would believe are better boxers. It doesn't matter because Muhammad Ali believed he was the greatest of all time. He's the only boxer that has ever nicknamed himself the greatest. In fact, this is the quote that he said. He said, I am the greatest. And I said that even before I knew I was. I figured that if I said it enough, I would convince myself and the world that I was really the greatest. Many of his opponents lost the fight, not because they stepped into the ring, but they lost it before they stepped into the ring because Muhammad Ali walked in this high level of confidence. Okay, what is my point? The same way Muhammad Ali believed and even had to convince himself that whatever was in him was great. I believe that everybody in this room has greatness inside of them. There's not a person in this room that God has created as average. There's not a person that God has created at subpar. But if you are created by God, he puts something inside of you 
that the world needs. And many of us are so hindered in the greatness that God has put in us because we're so busy trying to be like somebody else. We're trying to be like somebody else and we're, we're, we're trying to talk like somebody else. and We're trying to build that thing out the way they build. It. And God is like, yeah, that, that's OK. You'll be average in what you do. But if you really, really want to be great, you have to tap into what I put inside of you. Somebody look at your neighbor because they might need this one. Just say, you know, there's greatness inside of you. Look at somebody else and say, there's greatness inside of you. And I, 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 believe, I believe that part of my responsibility is to help you be confident in that greatness. I was telling some of my friends earlier this week that there are often times that I don't always feel confident, but I have to convince myself that I'm confident, I, I, that, that, I, that I'm great, and God put something in me. There, there, there are times where I realize I'm not the best leader. There are times where I realize uh, I'm not the best communicator. There are times that I realize I don't always give the best counsel. There are times where I realize my sermons might be, might be average, but you can't tell me when I get in the pulpit I ain't Jake's. You, you, you can't convince me I'm not because I'm that confident in what the Lord has put in me. So if I get up here and go, get ready, get ready, I just need y'all to be like, preach, Jake's, because I'm that confident what the Lord has put in me. Somebody just say confident. And I might have that confidence and I, I really want you to walk in that confidence, but please be careful because there is a thin line between confidence and arrogance. And I, I want us to be careful because God has called you to be confident in the greatness he put inside you, but he has not called you to be arrogant. There is nothing worse than somebody that is gifted, but arrogant. There is, there is nothing worse than somebody that is skilled, but arrogant, and I would argue the more gifted you are and the more the Lord has put in you, the more you have to be careful of confidence slash arrogance. Even Muhammad Ali bordered the line of confidence and arrogance. I asked the tech team to pull this, pull this picture up. This is a picture of Muhammad Ali on a flight. Notice he doesn't have a seatbelt on. And there's a story, this is a true story, that the flight attendant saw that they were about to land, and so she goes to... Muhammad Ali, and she whispers because she doesn't want to embarrass him. And she says, Mr. Ali, we're about to land. You have to put your seatbelt on. To which he yells at her back, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she responded back to him, Superman don't need no airplane. Put that seatbelt on. <laughs> there, there, there's a thin line between confidence and arrogance. And I believe that God doesn't want you to be arrogant and delusional. I believe that he wants you to be confident in all that he has put in you. We come to a passage where Jesus just crowned John the Baptist as the goat. He literally says he's goaded at what he does. He didn't just say that. He says he's the great. Another translation would say he's the greatest man that was ever born of a woman. So Jesus has no issue with you saying, yeah, I, I, I think I'm great. Jesus has no issue because he doesn't critique in the text. He calls him great. And I believe that everybody in this room, God doesn't just want you to be great, but he wants you to be great at all aspects. He wants you to be great at your job. He wants you to be a great employee. If you're a boss or a supervisor, he wants you to be the greatest manager, the greatest boss. He wants you to be the greatest husband. He wants you to be the, the, the greatest father. He wants you to be the greatest wife. He wants you to be the greatest mother. Singles, he wants you to be the, I don't want to leave the singles out. He wants you, come on, singles say amen back to me. He, he wants you to be the greatest at your single life. He wants you to be great at all aspects, not average, not subpar, but absolutely great at what you do. Somebody look at your neighbor and just say, he wants you to be great. Look, I'm not losing my place. I'm telling you that because you don't know how many people walk in and lack confidence. You don't know how many people walk in and don't feel great. And part of my job today is not just to tell you you're great, but convince you that God has put something in you. Quick context, because this would definitely be a prosperity sermon if I, you walked out and all I did was said you're great and didn't give you context. In the text in Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist is currently caught up in the greatest political scandal of the century. John the Baptist has been in jail, and the reason he was put in jail is because he spoke out against power. He spoke out against King Herod. King Herod was the king of the Jews under the rulership and the authority of the Roman Empire. Now, King Herod wasn't known for his, his mor uh, moral uh, character. 
He, he, he was known as being that dude that was just out in the streets. And so what he does is the Bible says that King Herod in, 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 in Mark 6 and in Matthew 14, the Bible says that King Herod seduces his brother's wife and steals her from his brother. And so John the Baptist hears about it and he calls him out on it. And the moment he calls him out on it, Matthew chapter four, he gets put in jail. Now, this is so interesting to me that he gets put in jail because as, he thrown, as he's thrown in jail, I'm trying to figure out and square away verse two with verse 11. Can, can we look at the two? Bef- before I look at these two, let me just be very clear. Greatness is not found in our circumstances because watch the text here. Verse two. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples. Jump down to verse 11. Jesus says, truly, I say, among those born of a woman, there has never arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Look at what Jesus just did. Jesus just said John the Baptist is the goat. He's the greatest. But don't miss this. Verse two says his circumstances that he's in jail. Now, now our culture will say it's no way he's great. But look at when it's not just that Jesus called him great. Jesus could have called him great back in Matthew 2. When John the Baptist is like, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, Jesus could have said, oh, that's my boy. He's the greatest. He doesn't do that. He waits until he gets put into prison. And then prison didn't detour his greatness. I need somebody to hear me. It wasn't the circumstance that swayed the greatness. Jesus calls him great despite the fact that he is currently in jail. And, and I believe when I was reading this earlier, I, I think one of the things that God wants us to do is redefine our metrics of what greatness is. Because culture will determine to us that greatness means I don't have issues. Culture will determine and try to say to us that greatness means that I have to go through life and I can't ever have hardship. But do you understand the oxymoron that just happened? It's so countercultural. The kingdom is so upside down. Jesus determined that he was great despite the fact that he was currently in jail. He's incarcerated. He's locked up. He's, he's in prison. He's in the slammer. Can I mess you up? He wasn't just in prison in chapter 11. Do you know he was put in prison in Matthew 4? So for 11 chapters, he's in prison all the way to Ma- Ma- uh, 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 Matthew 14. And this is what's even crazier. He dies in prison. Oh, wait, he's beheaded in prison. For 11 chapters, he's sitting in prison and Jesus didn't say, oh, he might have been. No, he is the greatest man born of a woman, despite the fact that his circumstances don't say the same. And I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody in here right now that you're trying to your litmus test of what greatness is, is determined for you, is determined by your circumstances. So as long as I'm not going through, then I'm really great. But I'm really talking to somebody in this room that's in the midst of job transitions. And you've, you've been applying for jobs and you've been applying for work and you've been getting no's and you've been getting the interview and you've been getting turned down and you get the second interview only to be turned down. You get the third interview only to be turned down. And many times we're sitting there going, oh, man, like I'm so average at what I do. You're great. I'm, I'm talking to somebody that's in the midst of a relationship. And that relationship, you've invested in it and you've invested in it. But there's turmoil in the relationship. Don't determine the greatness that God has put in you by the turmoil. You're still great. I'm talking to somebody that got a bad diagnosis and the doctor said you only got a few months and you're sitting there going, God, I can't be great. And I'm sitting here in the midst of a bad diagnosis in the midst of a bad diagnosis. You're still great. I'm talking to somebody that got financial issues. You got more months than money. And you're trying to figure it out and you're trying to move and you're trying to pay bills and you're just trying to stay afloat. You do not feel great. If John the Baptist can be called great while he's in jail, don't tell me your circumstances diminishes your greatness. You are great because God has created you. It is in those seasons of hardship that many of us begin to question that greatness And it's okay to question that greatness. I'm going to get to that in a second, but never allow life's turns to determine whether you're great. And let me just say good and bad, because sometimes we, you know, in the bad, we'll question our greatness. But sometimes when life is always good, you'll have a false sense of greatness. And that's where arrogance begins to to come into play. Life situations cannot determine whether you are great or you're not. You need something that's sure to determine your greatness. You need an anchor of the soul. You need somebody that the scriptures call immutable. 
You need somebody that the scriptures call in, un, unchangeable. You need somebody that the scriptures will say in Hebrews that he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You need a steadfast anchor, and we get that in Jesus. If you live life by the ups and downs of life, you'll never feel great or you'll feel too great. But you got you to gotta get low enough to be under the authority of Jesus and his consistency will always make you feel like there's greatness in me despite my circumstances. Circumstances don't sway your greatness. You are great, great whether you're going through or not. Now, John the Baptist is in the middle of a, of a hard situation. He's been put in jail. By the way, he's been in jail since chapter four. So he's been there for a minute and he begins to doubt. And what I want to do is I, I want to I normalize doubt today. Because many of us be like, oh, man, I, I, it's, it's no way I can really be following the Lord and really have faith and, and not have doubt. Do you know you can have faith and it can coexist with doubt? Yeah. It, it can actually coexist. Here, here's what John the Baptist says. And this, here's how I know he doubted. Verse 2. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples. Okay, here's what he says. He said to them, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? John the Baptist. John the Baptist just said, are you the one? That that means are you the Messiah? Are you the long awaited one that we've been waiting? Are you the one that created and sustains life? Are you the one that all the prophets wrote about? Are you the one that the Bible says the government will be sitting on your shoulders because you're not looking like the one because I'm in prison? You're not, you're not looking like him right now because I'm in jail. John the Baptist doubted. This is John the Baptist, y'all. I'm talking John the Baptist that followed Jesus. The Bible says he prepares the way for Jesus. This is John the Baptist who baptized Jesus. By the way, when he baptized Jesus, the Bible says that an audible voice speaks and says, this is my son of whom I'm well pleased. John the Baptist heard that. This is John the Baptist that witnessed the spirit of God ascending on him like a dove. This is that John the Baptist. Yet he doubted whether Christ was really the Messiah. And if John the Baptist doubted, can we give ourselves a pass today? Can you give yourself a pass? You might have walked in here and you doubted. If you haven't lived long enough to experience the are you the one moment, you will experience it. Anybody there right now where you just been asking like, God, like, are you are you sure? Is, is it really you? I'm not talking to spiritually deep people right now. I'm not talking about, about to, to people that feel like everything is always peachy keen. But I'm talking about to people right now that are in the midst of hardship and you're doubting and questioning whether this thing is really real. Well, John the Baptist just said, are you the one? You, you're the one that's to come. The person in here who has walked with the Lord the longest will still tell you that they have moments of doubt. Anybody walk with the Lord at least 20 years? 20 years, okay. Anybody walk with the Lord 25 years? Anybody walk with the Lord uh, 30 years? I mean, look at this. Anybody walk with the Lord 35 years? Anybody walk with the Lord 40 years? 35 years is where we stopped. I felt like it was an auction. 35 years (laughs) is where we stopped. But my mother-in-law just said she walked with the Lord 35 years. In 35 years, have you consistently doubted? Yes, that's the answer. You you know why? Because there are moments in life where life will hit you so hard it will contradict your theology. And don't you dare think your notes and your theology are going to save you. There are moments that life will slap you in the face and you will go, are you really the one? Or should I expect another? John the Baptist in this moment is doubting and it feels like a contradiction, but I want to normalize it today. Now, don't stay there. This is why we need community. This is why we need shameless plug for the small groups. Here's why we need discipleship. Shameless plug for discipleship. The reason we need those things is because every now and then when you're doubting, you need other people in your life to be like, oh, no, come on. He's going to hold you through that. Every now and then. You need a couple of people that when you quit. See, you need three people that y'all all, all, all quit on the same day. When you quit, somebody else should be like, "Uh uh-uh. And when they quit, you should be like, "Uh uh-uh. Stay with them. Why? Because every now and then you will say, are you the one? Now watch Jesus' response. He's asked the question by the disciples of John. Hey, Jesus, John in jail, he bugging. He asking, are you the one? Here's what Jesus says back to him, verse number four. Go tell John what you hear and see. 
The blind receive their sight and the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Look at what Jesus just did. He says he doesn't give him just a yes. He gives him cryptic code. He says, look at the works that I'm doing. But he names specific works, Caleb, and the specific works that he named goes all the way back to his first sermon. His first sermon was in Luke chapter 4. You should put this note somewhere in there. Rub Luke 4 up with Matthew 11 and see if they're identical. In Luke 4, when Jesus first preached his first sermon, here's what the Bible says. He, says that the, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and to recover the sight and the blind, to, uh, to, to set the liberty, uh, set, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. When I read that, I'm like, oh, that gave me goosebumps. I see what you here to do, Jesus. So when the disciples came, John's disciples came, he says, tell them what I preached the first time in Luke chapter four. And when they get there to tell him, do you know that Jesus actually left something off? In Matthew 11, he begins to quote the sermon. And I suspect that John the Baptist is going, oh, get to my part. Because John the Baptist is in jail. And there's a part of the sermon where Jesus says, I'm going to proclaim liberty to the captive. But he gets the word back and Jesus leaves it off. Why does Jesus leave it off? Because Jesus isn't here as some genie in the bottle that is always supposed to take you out of the fire. And many of us have said, yes, I'm going to give my life to the Lord. But you're not giving your life. You're not really submitted to the Lord. You want Jesus as fire insurance. You want him to bail you out when you're in the midst of hardship. You want him to bring you out. And sometimes he leaves you in because you're undone and it produces character and it produces patience and it makes you look more like his son, Jesus Christ. I need Jesus to be Jesus and not my genie in the bottle. And many of us have subscribed to this Jesus that orbits around my planet. And so what Jesus does is he says, look, give the word back to John. But, but, but leave that part off about the captives. Now, here's the thing. John the Baptist sits in jail, even though he got the word back that he's the Messiah and he dies in jail. He's beheaded in jail because of a stripper girl. He's beheaded in jail for being faithful. He's put in jail for being faithful. He's beheaded in jail for being faithful. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I think your greatness has been swayed because of your circumstance. And don't get it twisted. This, this isn't going to preach well. This isn't a good amen moment. And this certainly ain't going to preach in the prosperity circles. But there are times where God will leave you in it. But don't think that you're not great because you're still in it. You're, you're still great. You, there's still greatness in you. Even though you're in the midst of hardship, Christianity is never a I get Jesus plus stuff. Christianity is I get Jesus and he's enough. Is Jesus enough for anybody? If he never gives you anything else, is he enough for you? I love this text because what, what it does is it's, it's countercultural. It doesn't always add up. You know, many of us have subscribed to an unspoken equation where as long as I do good, 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 I'll receive good. But that's not how it works in the kingdom. Sometimes you can be minding your own business and life will slap you and you'll be like, God, are you the one? And he'll say, I'm the one, but you got to stay there a little bit longer. See, this stuff don't preach well. This stuff don't get a lot of amens, but, it's, but it builds something in us. And so never go through life thinking you're not great because you're in the midst of it and God allowed you to stay in the midst of it. No, no, no. That's how he does. And so greatness is not found in my circumstances. I might be in prison. Greatness is, 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 is okay. It's still there if I'm doubting. But do you know greatness also isn't found in our status? See, the culture will say you're only great as long as you have a great social status. As long as you got a lot of followers. And, you know, if I got that blue check, then I'm really great. But it, it's that defined in in our status. How do I know that? Look back with me, back with me at the text. We're just talking, y'all. Verse number seven, and they went away. Jesus began to speak to the crowds. Now he's going to talk to the crowds concerning John. Watch what he says. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? 
Yes, I tell you more than a prophet. This is interesting. Jesus talks about soft clothing here. Soft clothing is another way of saying fine clothing, expensive clothing, good material, put together well, custom fit. So Jesus says, when you see soft clothing, you can be sure that it's a person of status that is probably in the king's house. But here's what's crazy. He says, when you go into the wilderness, you didn't see that with John. What, what did I see with John? Here's what you saw with John. This is John's attire right here. Matthew chapter three, verse four. And John the Baptist wore a garment of camel's hair, a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And so if we define what Jesus is saying is if you define greatness as social standing and material possessions, you'll miss it. The person he just called the greatest man ever born of a woman has on camel hair. I put on my camel hair this afternoon (laughs) and I'm sweating because of it. But Kanye said, I'd rather sweat than be average. And so I put on my camel hair today. (laughs) Somebody said that's right. John the Baptist is called the greatest, but he doesn't have social standing. Jesus, I know you all see these people walking around here with soft clothing on. But I got somebody that got some rough camel hair on and he's doing my work. I got somebody that's eating bugs and honey and he's killing it. Ladies, can you imagine? Just kind of picture this with me real quick. You, you, you dating this dude, you know, you ain't, you ain't tell your girls about him yet. You're trying to fill him out. And you get to the point where you're like, you know what? He all right. He ain't got it all. He all right. I'm going to invite him over. I'm going to invite my friends over. I'm going to cook something and we're going to eat and I'm going to introduce all of them. And then your friends come over and then finally the young man walks in and he's wearing camel hair and, 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 he's, and he has a leather belt on and he says, what, what's that smell? Is that bugs and honey? Because that's what I eat. And then your girl's a little concerned. So they start asking questions like, like let, 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 me, let me ask you a question. Um, uh, what do you do for work? And he says, I'm a, I'm a preacher. Oh, whew, great. Where's your church? Well, I'm in the wilderness. I just kind of roam around. Wherever my ministry is, that's where I'm at. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Where do you live? I don't have a home. I'm I'm homeless. And then you go on Google, because y'all know we're going to Google everything, right? If I get your full name, I got everything. So we go in Google, and we put his name in Google, and only to find out that he's about to go to jail. And he's going to die while in jail. Now, he's not convinced that y'all are feeling him. So what he does, he says, I'm going to bring my cousin over. And so he brings Jesus over. And when Jesus walks in with lamb wool hair and he walks into the room and the the ladies and the girls say, well, what about you? What do you do? And he says, well, I'm a preacher, too. Well, where do you preach? Well, I don't I don't really have a church. Everywhere is my church. And then he says, and then the girls say, well, what about where do you live? Where, where, where's your home? And then he begins to quote to you, Matthew 8, 28, birds of the air have nests and the foxes have holes, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And they'd be like, what? what? Oh, I'm homeless. And then they Google him only to find out he's about to be convicted and he will be sentenced to death as well. My guess is that everybody in this room will be like, girl, don't you do it. He's a deadbeat. But the scriptures tell me that those are the two greatest men that have ever walked the earth. Watch this with no social standing, no soft clothes, nowhere to lay their head. But they were deemed as the greatest people that ever walked the earth. Why? Because many times we think that this thing is cultural, but it is countercultural. In the kingdom, it could be upside down. You could be broke and have greatness in you. Don't stay broke. But you can be broke and have greatness in you. <laughs> Got to put that one underneath. Don't stay there. Because it's not your social state. I'm not defined as being great because my 401k. I'm not defined as being great because of my economic bracket. I'm not defined as great because of my title and my position and where I work and what I drive. Jesus says, them men that have soft clothing, they ain't the greatest. The greatest got on camel hair. He doesn't have any social standing. So, no, 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 no. Don't don't you think that your job is the reason you're great? You you could be in between jobs and still be great, boo-boo. Don't think that you're great because of your salary. You can make the bare minimum, minimum wage and still be great. 
Don't think that you're great because of your title. You could be titleless and still be great because in the kingdom, God never sees great as external. Greatness is always what he puts inside of you. Now, let me lay on the plane here. Yeah, we've been talking about, G, about, about, about John the Baptist as being goaded. But do you know he's only goaded because he serves the one that's really goaded? It's, it's Jesus that is the greatest of all time. And what, what's crazy about Jesus being the greatest of all time is he came and the Bible says he emptied himself. He doesn't, he doesn't look like the greatest. You know what he says? He says stuff in Matthew 23, verse 8, like the greatest among you shall be your servant. So as I'm going, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great. Really what you should be hearing is serve, 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 serve. Because greatness is not found in me being put up on a pedestal. Greatness is found in me getting low on my knee before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That is greatness. So I don't know who it is in this room that you, you came in here and you've, you've been doubting. You, you, you're not sure of this thing called the Christian walk. Your external, you know, hardship have made you feel like you, you know, God ain't put nothing in you. You're not average. Let's play something small, soft. You're not average. You're great. You're not mediocre. I'm, I'm saying this because I want you to believe it. You're not mediocre. You're great. Bring up that self-esteem. Do you know who the God you serve is? Can we just talk? Do you know who the God you serve is? He says, I own a cattle on a thousand hills. God that you serve is the creator and sustainer of life. There's no way I can be average when I serve a God that's great. I'm heirs. I'm heirs to God. I want to pray for you. I believe that everybody's on the altar today. I really do. I believe everybody's on the altar because I think all of us at times struggle with feeling and believing that greatness is in us. But as you walk out of here today, I pray that you walk out with a little bit more confidence. Father, I pray for everybody in this room Thank you, oh God, for your word. I thank you that you have no problem calling people great. And that in that identification, Lord, I pray that it would not produce arrogance and cockiness, but that it would produce humility. That we would be low enough that we are always kneeling before your throne and always promoting he's the greatest. He's the greatest. Lord, I pray for somebody that is in between of jobs. I know how hard that can be. Pray for somebody right now that's struggling with infertility. I know how hard that can be. I pray for somebody right now that's struggling with turmoil in that relationship. I pray for somebody right now that's in the midst of financial issues. But may they never ever believe the lie that they're not great because of the circumstance. Father, build us up. Build us up to believe and trust in you and believe and trust that you are, you are the one who you say you are. And John is only called great because you are great. And you're not great because of John's circumstances. Yeah, he did ministry well, but he died in jail and he still was great. And so, Father, I pray, oh God, that we, would, we wouldn't believe the lie the culture shares and tells us. But that we would believe the truth of your word. That we are great because you are great. It's in Jesus' mighty name we give glory. Can somebody say amen?